My name is uh, Fifi Peters, and I am a an anchor and a moderator at CNBC Africa. And I'm here to uh, speak about your world and the opportunities that uh, your world has in store for you in a post-pandemic society. So essentially what we did see was the lights and the action and the camera work being cut by the COVID-19 pandemic that brought your industry to a standstill. And uh, productions were uh, shelved. We did see uh, cinemas and uh, theaters being closed, as well as perhaps many of you or your fellow colleagues in the industry being put out of work. Uh, but as I see it, I also think that the pandemic has uh, provided a lot of rich content, uh, particularly if we look at the fact that it uh, did give us the most unprecedented experience of the 21st century. And uh, so as we are talking about a post-pandemic recovery, we are discussing how Gauteng, which is the economic powerhouse of the African continent, can position itself as an ideal location for film production and also a gateway into the rest of the continent. And as uh, Mini did say, I'm having this conversation with uh, many individuals on the stage who need no introduction, uh, very acclaimed individuals in the creative space, but I'm gonna introduce them to you anyway. Uh, starting with the uh, wonderful lady on my right, Ms. Gidume Zilebaka, who is the interim CEO at the Gauteng Film Commission, as well as chairperson of the Africa Leadership Transformation Foundation. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Fifi. And uh, seated uh, next to her is Silo Maka Kanube, who is the uh, founder of the Silo Maka Kanube Foundation. I'm going to introduce you because uh, this is going to be documented on camera, and I think that the uh, viewers who are watching this, uh, who might not know, uh, will be delighted to know that he is a multi-award winning veteran actor in South Africa. I'm not calling you old, sir. Uh, he has appeared in movies and television productions such as The Long Walk to Freedom, uh, the iconic soapy generations that I grew up watching, and uh, more recently, The Queen. He has also been part of the uh, Royal uh, Shakespeare Company and played in London's West End and uh, played the lead role of Mufasa uh, <laughs> there in The Lion King musical. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. And uh, right next to him, we've got uh, Tabang Muleya, who is the executive producer of Siriti Films. And uh, some of his work does include the well-known drama series Gomorrah, The Herd, and Jacob's Cross. And uh, Tabang's uh, debut film, Happiness, is a four-letter word, became the highest grossing box office film in 2016. And of course, many of you would have seen the uh, sequel that is uh, currently out on Netflix, but uh, let's show you a bit of uh, Tabang's work in action. You've been embezzling money from your bank. I can. And we've been watching you for quite a while now. Don't I look stunning? Sports cars, trips abroad. I'm not talking about that, Bali. Yes, yeah, so we China Matani, high tech lender. Your friend got shot. I'm looking for the most badass operators out there. Peter Swan. I'm not afraid. Give it time. Getting shot isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. Tell that to your hands. Sure giving his client his money's worth? We've been looking at your performance lately. Welcome to the big boys. He specifically requested you. You're a truly amazing woman. You are a client. Okay. You still love her. What more could you ask for? I actually don't know what I want. Well, you better figure it out. Life all this time! Enough of the sappy nonsense. 60-year-old boy from Boxburg. I'm not gonna let you go. 
I can't lose you two. Suck it up and do the job. I just wanted you to know in case you gave a shit whether he lives or dies. He's not gonna make it. I lost a patient. I need your help. What do you know about the bomb? I want a name! What a terrible thing to happen to a little girl. Look at me! Talk about your work speaking for yourself. Well done. Yay. <laughs> uh, and uh, then we also have uh, Pearl uh, Makakangube, seated next to uh, Tabang. Welcome, ma'am. Thank and, you. And uh, she is the executive brand advisor at uh, the Dr. Winnie Mashaba and uh, also uh, the uh, brand uh, uh, um, advisor for uh, Mr. Silo Makakangube. The two work very closely to... Uh, together. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. You want to say something before you introduce? No, no, no. I'm you want to, <laughs> you know, hint, hint at the uh, last names, nonetheless. Uh, I'm, I'm just watching it how Brazil is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the man who was forward enough to start speaking before intro being introduced, but nonetheless, we love it. We love it. Mr. Kahiso Mudupe, who is the founder and executive producer of Bakwena Productions. Also an award-winning uh, actor and producer known for the films uh, Koch Helen, Unpredictable Romance, and Losing Lerato, which he acted alongside his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that particular film actually won six uh, awards. Uh, I, um, I miss you on Scandal. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, we'll talk about that <laughs> offline. Nonetheless, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, you. yeah. Uh, so let's get straight to the order of uh, business. Yeah. Uh, because, hey. Halala. Hello. All right, we'll try to keep it together. Why? Uh, Moya? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And it worked. And it worked. I love it. Uh, so we are talking about uh, your industry trying to emerge from this uh, crisis in one piece. And uh, as a reporter, I can say that uh, we have read the horror stories of what has happened to your industries by way of the statistics and the thousands of people that have been uh, left without income and without jobs. But perhaps let's make it a bit personal. And I'd like a personal account from uh, a few of you uh, who are in the or who have skin in the game, as uh, they say, as to how the pandemic affected your world uh, personally. And uh, Silo, can I begin yes. with you, sir? Wow, okay, thank you very much. It's a very difficult question, <laughs> because how do you come out of the, co the you know, the COVID um, uh, effects? And the thing is to sit back and just moan about what we lost is not going to help us at all. All we've got to do now is how do we take the industry forward? How do we make um, the industry in such a way that it is not solely dependent on, you know, what is the presence of people and all that? Because uh, the, most of the spaces that were affected or the, the aspect of the creative industry that was affected most was the theaters. Because theaters are dependent on the audience. Uh, the music events, they are solely dependent on people coming together. You know, but uh, I think as far as television, television was the one that actually just, you know, in the middle of what, level three, level three? was it level three? You know, the doors began to open and actors who were working in that space, you know, began to work. But actors who were working in, in the theater, there, there was a, it was a no-go area. And even now, we are just busy like teetering on the whole thing. So moaning about what happened will never help us. You know, it will be like scr uh, crying over spilt milk. What we need is to take the industry forward. How do we make it in such a way that even a live performance performed in the theater but captured digitally could still work? I think right. that's the, you know, we've got to look, find new ways on, on circumventing whatever challenge that we will get. Right. Yes. So we're not going to mourn. 
but we are going to go down uh, memory lane or go to the past a bit yeah. just to see what we can learn. Absolutely. Uh, they say that the next crisis around, is around the corner. We don't know what it will look like. So I just want to learn if yeah. you indulge me with your teaching, sir. Okay. You, mean you want to learn? Uh, let me get the question again. I'm saying we're just going to learn about the experience of the pandemic. Yeah. Such that we can use that learning and that experience to better position us for a perhaps less disrupted walk forward. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and that is not something, it's not a solution that will just come up, you know, sure. on the, you know, a snap of a finger. It is something that is going to have to be tested, you know, and see how people react to it, you know. Um, and, uh, like, I think, you know, the, the, the way to go, I mean, even sometimes for live theater, and this we have seen, you know, during the hard lockdown, how people continued to perform, but performing in front of cameras. You know, so, uh, and somehow people digitally, you know, could connect and all that. Yeah. But the, the, the thing that we're going to have to, I guess, look into is actually just to make sure. And here, I think scientists are the ones, you know, that, I have to, that are going to have to come in and make sure that they come with the remedies for whatever diseases that, um, you know, that are, that are hitting humanity. I mean, I remember one of the things that I had planned for, um, what is it, 2020, sure. was actually to do a performance of a, of, a, of a play which was going to be centered around using the tourism industry. Because what I had done was I had observed how um, the tourists come to Soweto. I mean, they would go and see all the, you know, um, herit heritage uh, spaces, and they will come to um, Hector Peterson, uh, and then after Hector Peterson, the audience, I mean, the, the tourists will actually have to go to Sakumzi, go and have a meal and, you know, and eat. And I had um, planned to do a play on June 76, mm. so that after they had actually jo um, enjoyed all the heritage sites and the history of the country, and then come and see a play, you know, that basically, you know, Summarize the, the, you know, the, the, the journey. And the play was basically going to be uh, telling the story between 76 and 94, the uprising. So it was the uprising of June 76 and the uprising of the flag, which would have just you know, covered the whole space. Is it still but because out? the tourist industry was affected, that couldn't happen. Is it still coming out though? Well, it is, absolutely. Okay. It's still on the cards. Yeah. Okay. They say, unlike a restaurant, life has a tendency of dishing out what you never ordered. That's where the expression, life is unfair, stems from. If I were to say life is unfair, it would be an understatement. You've been yellow boned. If you want to kill yourself, you must do it alone. I told Gogo I got a part-time job doing promotions over the weekends. Just like everyone who makes a deal with the devil, there is always a price to pay. What are you doing as a school to prevent bullying? It's to take it upon ourselves to conduct an internal investigation. Hi, Wenaman. Hi, Nana. I love a person who claps for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> we did well in this pandemic. Man. Well praised. Uh, Tawan, uh, I see that you have got uh, audio. So, so just, yeah, your reflections of the past 20 months, what's it, what it's taught you about your industry uh, going forward. Um, sure. I thought this mic wasn't working. <laughs> um, so, if anything, it's taught me uh, that the film industry is an essential service. Um, you know, I know we, uh, we couldn't shoot for the first uh, four to five weeks uh, before we could commence production again. And I think that during the pandemic, it just taught us that as creators, uh, producers, filmmakers, that content is needed, uh, films are needed, stories need to be told for people to actually make it through a very difficult time. Um, the sense of escapism, the sense of uh, stepping into someone else's world, 
is such an essential service. Uh, so for me, if anything, the past 20 months has taught me that or made me realize the importance of film and TV and any sort of entertainment. You're right, um, and especially if you look at uh, the results of Netflix in the past uh, 20 months. Uh, they've shot through the roof as a result of all of us uh, having the service and the comfort of uh, consuming the content that some of you guys have produced yeah. uh, at a time when we couldn't move around. Gariso Yusa, your lessons, your reflections. My reflection is, in honesty, we, we came back from, you know, from, the, you know, from LA and we had just won 10 international awards. And at that time, on the day we landed, the president shut down, you know? So it was a, it was a bit of a shock for us. But for me, what I've learned is that as artists, we need to get out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys who really struggled are guys who were, all, who, who were like comfortable with what I do and I'm an actor and I go to work and this is what I do and that's it. But what I've learned is that people now, as artists, we need to start diversifying and not just be an actor, but be an actor and be a director, sure. uh, be, be a writer. So I spent most of my time having to write and we've got four projects. By the time uh, you know, things started easing out, we were in work mode, and this is the film that we shot, and, and we're going to cinema with it, you know? Um, and there's other productions Ooh. that are there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, I think that's the lesson that, that we have learned, is that, you know, we need to start understanding ourselves as a business, and not just as entertainers. We need to see how, you know, other revenues of, of what we do, you know, can be helpful to us. Find other paths, you know? That's... that's that's basically what, what I learned through, through this whole pandemic, you know? And, and to agree with Tabang as well, to say, when, when everything else was shutting down, our industry was still alive because people needed content. People needed to, to consume something. People needed a stress reliever. And, 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 and most of the people were working from home. Mm. So, so, you know, this, this sector should have been one of the sectors where you know, um, should have been allowed to at least <laughs> function <laughs> so that we could, we, could, we could keep the people entertained. And, and we realize the importance of, of, of our sector and, we, and the messaging that's, that's behind it. You know, uh, we, we've, we've, we've taken entertainment as just, ah, it's entertainment, it's entertainment. But during COVID, <coughs> we realized that we have an influence to millions and millions of people we are able to drive a message to millions and millions of people where there were women you know, who, were, who were suffering from gender-based violence. And it was through our stories that we were able to have families sit down and talk about gender-based violence. If the pandemic did not happen, most of them would, would not have the opportunity to sit and digest and, and dissect you know, um, some of the ills that we are facing. And through film, we were able to do that. So congratulations to all the filmmakers who put out their stories out there. You have to applaud now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you laughing uh, in reflection, uh, as you were reflecting rather about the lockdowns, and I just wanted to say the president is not in the room to hear you say that perhaps he didn't handle it properly. Uh, <laughs> but you are on camera. I am uh, on camera. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so nonetheless, we are here to talk about a positioning for a post-COVID-19 world. You are here to hear about the opportunities that the, uh, the Gauteng Film Commission has in a store for you, how they can assist you to uh, continue to be relevant in your industry. And thus, like you, Dumezi, we've heard where we're coming from in the past 20 months with the personal accounts of the... Um, the players in the game, as it were, but uh, help us understand where we can go to, particularly as a, as a province. As the Gauteng Film Commission, what is it that you guys are about and uh, how is it that you're looking to help the industry? Thank you, Fifi. The Gauteng Film Commission is a funding and development agency, particularly in the audiovisual industry. Our role is to empower writers, producers and directors in the type of films they shoot and ensure that we capacitate or even empower them to make international circuit. And fellow speakers have indicated that 
the COVID-19, part of the blessing part of it, has shown us that this industry is essential and has really opened the eyes to other key players in the industry on the importance of it. Because as other speakers have also indicated that one of the key things that was keeping the country going was the entertainment. What was keeping professional goings was the entertainment. Having served as well as the chairperson of the COVID-19 sports adjudication relief program. Sure. I was in the sports, but I got an opportunity to see most of the applications from the arts industry. And you would see that the sector was highly impacted. Impacted because it, is, it thrives on face-to-face -face interaction. Yes. But what we also saw, interestingly enough, were platforms that were created at that particular time. You know, various um, filming that were taking place. It was interesting to notice some of the apps that started taking place where grandparents started reading stories to their children. And this was all videographed. All right. Apologies. Apparently the weather. How still not talk to it. Please, please, Brazil. We're more, yeah. More, yeah. I would tell But apparently, Galabocha, <laughs> Papa. But apparently, this weather is uh, disturbing the uh, production and the conversation. Due to bad weather in Durban, the panel discussion had to be cut short. But Fifi Peters caught up with some of the panelists afterwards to gain more insight into the film and audiovisual industry in Gauteng. We've seen a, a lot of um, big companies in the industry spend heavily on uh, local content. Uh, we were talking about multi-choice, uh, even the likes of Netflix. But as a, a producer of local content, what opportunity do you see for African content to be consumed a lot more in the rest of the world? Look, we, as much as we are, we, are, we are producing content, we are still relying heavily on, on international distributors. Netflix is international. You know, uh, Amazon is international. Universal is international. Even in the music space, you know, Sony is still international. We need to have a Netflix, an African Netflix, where, where American content is trying to get onto our space, not us trying to do the other way around. So that's what we're trying to create. And that's, I think for me, that's, that should be the vision for Africa. And MultiChoice is doing a very good job at that because, you know, um, they've got all the countries in Africa and their content is being consumed by the rest of Africa. Yeah. Uh, we also saw the uh, film and entertainment industry being one of the most impacted by the uh, pandemic. Yes. Things, were, things were pretty tough, but what, uh, as we're talking about a, a post-pandemic world, what does that look like for your industry, for film production? It's great. Uh, it, it's, it's looking amazing. People are working uh, you know, from home, um, and I think that's going to be the trend now. You know, so which means that a lot of content needs to be out there. People are going to be consuming a lot of content. So that brings the attention to, to, to our industry. Because most of the attention has been on corporate, it's been on government. But now, you know, the content uh, uh, is coming from us. And corporate needs for us as content producers to be producing and, and putting out their message. But as a local uh, content producers, are you finding that access to uh, markets and access to the spaces of some of the uh, big distributors of content is, is uh, easy to get into? I don't know if you quite understand what I'm trying to ask, but uh, many a times you'll find that a, um, a, a local entrepreneur, be it in whichever sector, finds that uh, you know trying to fight it off with the uh, bigger companies in the industry is a lot more difficult and they shut out. And I just want your experience of access to markets and the mainstream platforms. I think it's a perfect question, especially for me, because that's what I went through. You know, uh, I'm an independent and, and I had to go and school myself. 
and having to understand how you know the major companies operate and then make the decision to say I'm gonna stand and do it by myself. I mean I look at my first film where I was trying to sell it you know overseas and Lionsgate uh, bought into it, uh, Warner Bros uh, bought into it and the only thing that they said is that we don't want African actors, we'll have our own actors and I would have gone for the deal but it's it's about firstly it was about my daughter because I had promised her that we're gonna be in this film together but secondly it was about saying look I, as an African, I, as a content producer, uh, I'm able to produce the same uh, quality uh, as Warner Bros, as Lionsgate, and I need to, to really just cast on about a chance we can element, you know, and just, just stand your ground and, and go against it, yeah. Just finally, uh, going back to this conference where we have seen a lot of uh, policy makers attend, we've seen a lot of uh, big business attend as well as um, these small to medium enterprises, but from a policy point of view, what needs to change to uh, help your industry uh, capitalize more on the opportunity that you have described in a post-COVID-19 world where we're going to be working from home a lot more and needing to consume a lot more content that perhaps is on the shelf because the environment is not easy to get it off the shelf. Policy is created by the people and that's one thing that we tend to forget. How Nelson Mandela took over this country, it wasn't based on policy, you know, and we, we, we taking that and we throwing it out the, the window. We're not going to wait for policy. We're not going to wait for some people who don't understand what the industry is about to create policies for us. And that's why I'm the first black, actually, I'm the first producer in Africa to pay royalties, you know, which is some of the, you know, uh, the issues that we are fighting for. And we've been fighting for it for a very long time. So we need to start being the change that we want to see in the industry. Uh, you know, uh, when you work for, 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 for Bakwena Productions, is that you get paid for the next 30 years. We didn't wait. For, for, for policies to be to be. and and with this conference yes there is policy you know talk but the question is how long is it going to take for it to be in effect because entertainers are dying as paupers our cameramen are dying as paupers um, our our producers are dying as paupers our famous stars they are dying as paupers let's be the change that we want to see I think um, it will be interesting to see how many other uh, productions follow in your footstep, uh, particularly regarding royalties. It's a very important uh, step that you have taken, but we'll leave it there for now, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we were talking about the Gauteng Film Commission, um, what you guys are about and what you guys are doing here at the uh, Trade Fair. Thank you very much, Fifi. Gauteng Film Commission is really a bridge to discover various film locations within Gauteng. We know that Gauteng is the bedrock of the film industry. Over 54% of productions take place in Gauteng. And we also declare that Gauteng is a home of champions because if you see many people that come from various provinces across the country, they come to Gauteng. And it has been that place historically. The reason we're coming here is one, we need to engage with Africa as our counterparts in order to bring investment of firm into Gauteng as a province. This for us is a way of empowering filmmakers in the province emerging and established it will also allow opportunities for collaboration in other countries as well because we see Africa as a whole big continent and for us it is therefore very important to start having these conversations with our counterparts. So would you say that Gauteng uh, is open to our neighbors because uh, at certain times we haven't always shown ourselves as a South Africans to be welcoming to the rest of the continent. Gauteng is um, open to our neighbors and especially you know what we've seen is that there are firms that are taking place that are being shot by our counterparts in Gauteng you know and um, what is important 
is for us to then start having an open door approach and start having discussions to say if we are to engage what are our rules of engagement how do we engage here henceforth and also be able to share the bigger vision because we believe that Africa is not even the next best thing it is the best thing and we need to start collaborating and showing the world that we are the best thing you know, so for us, yes, we are welcoming and it's important to start forging this relationship, um, having flagship projects that show what can come out as we stand united as African filmmakers. It's already happening in some parts with most of the production companies and we need to then widen the net to say how do we create this more viable partnership. In terms of uh, some of the work that the uh, Gauteng Film Commission does, you uh, assist some productions uh, with funding. And I'd like to know how much uh, you have uh, perhaps set aside uh, to fund uh, productions in a post-COVID-19 world. And even whether you are speaking with the private sector or other stakeholders about the opportunity to partner with you to fund the industry's recovery. All right, let me start off by saying that over the last 10, 15 years, Gauteng has funded more than 400 projects as a commission. We have also uh, trained more than 30,000 students in the industry. We have also indirectly contributed to over 21,000 jobs. So having said this, it is important to note that as the GFC, there is a course that we, we, we are calling for. Now, when we move on to say how do we help opposition after the COVID-19, we realize that the COVID-19 has impacted the industry. We realize the importance of having a recovery strategy. And our GFC Discover is just that campaign to say we've gone through a rough patch. How do we recover? How do we reignite? How do we empower our writers? How do we empower our producers? How do we empower our directors so that the movies that they shoot make it into the international circuit because we know once they make it out there more money is coming to South Africa when more money is coming into South Africa it revitalizes the economic hub of Gauteng there are a number of jobs direct and indirect. We've started having discussions with government to say how do we increase the GFC budget in order to cater for those who've been hard impacted by the COVID-19. We've started also having engagement with private sector and you know for me it has been the openness that private sector is saying how can we engage as well because through some of the CSI budget they're looking for something meaningful to contribute in the sector and we know very well that through the pandemic it has put the arts and, and, and culture as a sector in the forefront because we now see we need it. It has also allowed organizations to say from a more digital point of view how do we move on you know, you no longer only find uh, ads in the uh, or companies in your normal billboards, but you now find them in social media. And who are they using? They're using arts culture practitioners. Who do they need? They need the filmmakers to tell the story because it's got to now take a different form. What we're also doing is to say, let us start having conversations about digital innovation within the audiovisual industry because we don't want to miss the bus. We're going somewhere and we need to say, how do we prepare ourselves for the future? We've started discussions with a number of 
private film producers, our key stakeholders in the industry, because we understand that if we are to move forward as a GFC, we can't go and say, hey guys, this is the next big thing. But we need to sit down to say, this is the next big thing. We agree, now as a GFC, we need to say, how do we contribute to this next big thing and also come with government together to say let us support as part of growing the industry. I believe that in terms of digital innovation we've got great talent in Gauteng. There's so much to be done and we as the GFC are putting and raising our hand to say how can we make it possible as we engage and merge into the future ahead of us. Perfect. Thanks so much for your time. So I did a bit of reading about you and I understand that you entered the industry at the age of 18. Uh, you used to wash and uh, dry makeup sponges. <laughs> and uh, I'm interested in, uh, you know, Af how you are seeing demand and consumption of African content today compared to when you first started all those many years ago. What's changed? Well, I think for me, Growing up, uh, how I fell in love with storytelling, um, my grandmother told us stories. And, you know, like every single night she'd tell us a story uh, so that we could go to bed. So from like, you know, a young age, storytelling has always been a part of my family. Then we got a VHS machine and we would get, and I would get movies. But I never saw, like growing up, I never saw black people on those movies. It would be action movies, it would be... Uh, you know, like movies that, uh, karate movies, like, you know, just like movies a kid would enjoy watching. And I think for me, my curiosity or my love for storytelling was a part of it, whether I knew it or not, consciously or subconsciously, was like, I want to see a reflection of my people on those screens, you know. Um, and I think where it, from that time to where it is now, we've seen a lot of black owned production companies in this country not too many in obviously our transition of democracy is also quite young um, and it's also a very you know it's not an it's not an easy industry to be successful in but we're seeing a lot more black stories we're seeing stories that are proudly African we're seeing stories that celebrate our people that have a true reflection of who we are and we're also seeing a lot of our stories travel the world and I can't I'm excited about the time that we're in now and I can't imagine what it's going to look like two, three, five, ten years from now. Do you think, I mean, as we are having this conversation here at the Intra-Africa Trade Affair, do you think there is an opportunity and a need for uh, stakeholders uh, from government to business to support the industry a lot more in accessing some of those export opportunities that you have spoken about? And what does that support look like in your view? Well, the support looks like, uh, you know, our content is our movies, our series are traveling the world. Um, the ownership is what's going to be the legacy. We've seen too many legends in our industry that have worked 30, 50 plus years and when they pass they don't have anything to leave for their families. Um, whether it's people in front of camera or behind the camera, ownership is so important and how we get to own that is we get to go into collaborations with streamers where it's licensed deals where the streamers have a percentage and the creators have a percentage of the work that they're um, streaming out to the world. That's the only way that we're going to see a lucrative industry for the people that are actually on the ground working it. Talking about streaming and uh, different platforms of consuming content, up until uh, about a month ago, I, I was one of those who believed that the cinema was dead. Then I went to go see the James Bond movie and um, I've changed my mind. But in terms of distribution and uh, content platforms, how do you see things changing after the pandemic? Just uh, talk to me about uh, the, what changes in terms of the uh, traditional platforms we used, to use, we used to consume content from television to uh, film on the, on the uh, cinema and now, you know, with the streaming, what changes? So I don't think that, you know, there's, I don't think cinema is going to die. Because I think cinema is a culture of, uh, it's in as much as you say, I'm going out for dinner or I'm taking 
uh, my nephew's out for paintballing or I'm going to the arcades with the little one. Like, it's a part of uh, people's um, day or evening, you know. So that culture of buying popcorn and sitting in a big screen, even though you have as many, like three or four platforms of streaming at home, whether you have Netflix, Amazon, um, Showmax, the culture of still going to the cinema is an experience. So the experience of cinema I don't think will ever die. What's happening in our household is that the, uh, the, op the options of where we want to watch content has extremely become like available to and also you know it's the middle age it's it's you know it's the middle middle to high end income kind of people right what we haven't cracked yet is like people that want to consume content but can't really afford subscription right so it's the security guards the mamas that are helping with cleaning or those like people people enjoy watching content it doesn't matter how much you're earning right so it's really about creating a streaming service or a streaming platform where you know maybe their subscription is five rand a week they'll pay I definitely know that they'll you know so it's really about like I would say you know uh, your telecoms I think that I think uh, people in the telecom space are missing an opportunity at saying let's champion like all of the like people are competing for this market but no one's looking at this market which is actually a mess you know um, so I'm excited about where content is going and how people are consuming it. Um, and all, especially with the youth as well, with Instagram, with TikTok. It's just like people are actually making lucrative uh, business and being able to support and grow their livelihoods from things that we wouldn't have imagined five years ago. Talking about the youth, uh, what has featured quite prominently at this conference is the importance of maximizing the potential of a big uh, young population that this continent does have to offer, but a young population that uh, presently doesn't have access to opportunity or even jobs. What kind of uh, opportunities by way of employment uh, can your industry offer the youth to help put a dent in the horrific rates of unemployment that we see in this country? You know, the thing that we always talk about is training, like training, workshops, workshops, internships, and we can talk about those till the cows come home. What the problem is, is that the, there's talented youth that have paid exorbitant amount of fees over two, three years, even short courses, and they have been trained, and they do have the skills. They don't have the opportunity. So that's the huge gap that's actually happening. We're spending a lot of time on training, and we're not looking at the gap that's saying, actually, We've got, you know, half a million to a million students who actually have a really good understanding and have been trained and have diplomas, whose parents have paid too much over the period of studying this, like, uh, this medium, and they don't have those opportunities. So that's the gap that needs to be filled. How do we fill that gap? We need to give them the opportunity to create the content. We need to give them a platform where that content can be seen. We need to... Once that platform is created for them, they can start earning and start making, like, you know, income from they've studied. Now it's time for them to actually start working. So that for me is like, you know, there's so many programs that I've seen of training and like short courses. And, but a lot of the time, because I'm so, I'm on the ground with the youth, a lot of the time they're like, can you give me an internship? Can you give me an internship? Can you give me an internship? And we don't have enough companies to get, to do single one, two, three individual internships. We need to actually challenge ourselves and say, how do we create a platform for this, these talented individuals to be able to make an income from the skills and the knowledge that they have in the medium of film and TV?